All right, everybody, we're back. Um, the final part of our mechanical assembly. I've got our transformers in place. This is going to be a very short video. Um, we already have all our pots, pilot light, uh, bias pot, uh, tube sockets, your octals and your novals, nine pin, um, power switches, your fuse holder, your ground switch, imp uh, output jacks, uh, vibrato reverb pedal, and your reverb in and out right here. Okay, so. When we look at this, you know, at the transformers, you'll see something that's very common in fenders. Um, and it was true in the tweeds, it was, you know, it's true in the brown face, it's true in the black face, and even in the silver face. If you always notice, when you look at the chassis, um, of course with the pots facing away from you, your power supply is always on the left. Um, now they, there was a lot of thinking that went into that, as simple as that sounds. but. What they did was they tried to isolate all the AC hum uh, to make the amp actually quieter and have the, all the AC, the high voltage AC stuff on one side of the amp, which was your power transformer. And they kept everything, your DC signal, guitar signal, um, and DC voltage, the lower, you know, for the screens, plates, things like that, um, on the other side of the chassis. So we have a power transformer here. We have our choke here, two black leads. I'll show you underneath here in a second. We have our output, excuse me, output transformer primary, which is our red, blue, and brown. We have our output transformer secondary, which is black and green. This is an 8 ohm output transformer. And then we have our reverb driver. Uh, the primary is red and blue, and the secondary is black and green here. And these all come out with the same hole. So the output um, transformer primary and the choke wires come through in the same hole. And I'm going to flip this over. So we can see, again, power transformer, uh, 6v6 choke, output transformer, reverb driver. And it was very efficient the way they did it because, of course, your power transformer and your uh, 6v6 driver that they used was in the power supply. Um, they kept those together as close as they could. Um, they also tried to keep um, the, the output transformer you know, as close as to one side as they possibly could. I, I'm, so it, it was really smart the way they did the, these things. And, of course, the reverb driver... Because the the you know reverb recovery or excuse me the, the tube driven reverb and send and recovery is on you know right here and they put it right in between to minimize having wiring going all over the the chassis. Now when I flip this back over, I'm talking about the tr output transformer. If you notice the primaries, where they're going to go is to the plates and the B plus of the actual amp itself. So it was very efficient in the way they did this. Um, they minimized. Uh, transformer lead length to the actual tube sockets themselves with everything across the amp. Of course the reverb driver is right here. Um, the jacks for that you'll have the, the two primaries on the tubes, one on the you know towards the, the power supply for this and then you have your your secondaries which ground goes to you know a ground on what I like to do with this with if you happen to notice the backs of these they have tabs, uh, triangular tabs that are actually fastened to the um, actually the washers that are on the RCA jacks, the vintage style RCA jacks. And what I like to do, uh, just as a habit, I take two of these and I'll actually bend them up for ground points. And I'll use one of these as a ground point um, for a vibrato and I'll use one of these ground points as, or for our, our reverb driver here for the reverb circuit. And that minimizes the wire that you have going to your components. Um, again, output transformer, the uh, secondary wires are you know, further away, they have them terminate through the chassis, um, further away from the primary and from the AC that come down here that are very short because your jacks are right here and it only needs to be that long. So it was very efficient in the way that they thought about things and made them. Um, now the extra holes that we have here, if you notice, there's a bunch of extra holes. Up here we have our uh, body supply board, the two holes that mount right here. We have our actual board mounting holes right here, there's two of them. And we have four holes here, which are actually for the cap pan that go up underneath uh, the chassis right here. We'll have to build that, and it sits here. It's called some people call it the doghouse, but it's the cap pan, um, you know, filter supply cap pan. And they did that for space saving. So because this board is long, um, almost as long as a super and twin reverb, it took up a lot of real estate in here. I mean, it's genius the way they did it because it was the Henry Ford way of manufacturing things. They would have, you know. They would have the, the actual mechanical assembly of the chassis being built at the same time as the boards were so that when they, you know, they, he figured everything out in timing and, 
you know, when the bore was coming out, the chassis was going out, and then they had somebody mate the two, and, and it was really efficient the way they did that. Um, so, but one thing, uh, another thing I want to hit upon, and I think I, I talked about this in the 5e3 video, is that some of these holes, you'll notice, um, don't have, well, actually, the chassis holes are in the deluxe. I think this might be the only one like this. But we did not put holes in the fiberboard. And the reason in the main fiber board and also in the, what did I do with the E? I don't know where it's at. But the same thing for the body supply board. There's no holes in it. Now, the reason we did that, we get yelled at a lot about this, but there's a reason for this. And the reason was, or actually is, that there are a lot of OEMs that buy these kits. There, we, the last I counted, there's 146 OEMs, not including the small boutique guys. They'll actually buy these kits um, change a couple of components in them and sell them as booty camps. They didn't want us to put holes in them um, because a lot of these guys also do rebuilds on the side. Uh, we deal with a lot of restoration experts for these things. Um, and come to find out, some of these chassis, or not some of them, but a good portion of them, these holes were drilled on the line. Um, if for whatever reason they didn't have the holes in the board, of course they would use punches on these. Um, and sometimes the holes were not in the chassis. So they actually drill these holes by hand on the chassis. And the reason we don't put them in the actual board itself is because these boards are also designed to be direct drop-in replacements for the originals. Um, and those were hand drilled. So if we went ahead and put the, all the holes in, you know, for the mounting on, on some of the other black faces as well, uh, what you would have a exposed hole. Chances are, if we put the two holes in it where our chassis are at, it's not going to line up with yours. So you're going to have to drill a second set of holes. And we had a lot of people say, no, please don't do that. Just leave them blank and we'll drill them the way they are. And that's why we do that. Um, that the fact that a lot of people will use this board and not just a deluxe reverb. They'll actually mate this up with, um, I've seen them, you know, hot rod deluxes and everything else to put them in that. And they don't just don't want a lot of extra holes in the board because they're going to have to redrill them anyway. So that's, that's why we do that. Um, but that, you know, again, when you make it to this level of building, worrying about two, two holes in the boards, it, it's kind of a trivial or, you know, uh, <laughs> not, not much thought goes into that when you need to drill it. So it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. So, but yeah, that's, that's what's going on. This is the last stage of the mechanical build. Again, I'm leaving the output jacks out or the input jacks out. I'm leaving the knobs off because I will be moving the chassis around. I don't want to break the knobs or scratch them up or anything. Um, and this is ready to set to the side um, to wait to actually have the board constructed and then once the board is constructed with all the leads um, we'll, we'll tie down all the transformer leads where they need to go um, so that will be done part of the wiring will be done then and then we'll drop our board in and start working on the wiring on that the reason I don't like to uh, Again, it's, it's just a matter of preference. Um, a lot of people at this point will go ahead and do the transformer leads um, all together, but my shop's kind of small, uh, and when using that vintage Kester solder, vintage style rather, Kester solder, it smokes a little bit, and I like to have everything ready to go. When I turn that iron on, I only want to turn it on once. So if I do that, then I can knock this out as well as the board out at the same time and turn it off and be done with it. So that's why I like to do that. But you can certainly, at this point, you can certainly go ahead and, you know, wire in the transformers if you like. Um, but again, this is the, the last part in the mechanical build. And the next video, I will start on the actual board construction itself with all the parts. That's when things get fun and you need a lot of concentration. All right. Thank you guys so much for, for watching us. Um, and we'll be back. I'll have some more goodies for you. All right. Be safe.